chapter eight, and then there were none. Bloor was easily roped in. He expressed immediate agreement with their arguments. What you've said about those China figures, sir, makes all the difference. That's crazy, that is. There's only one thing. You don't think this Owen's idea might be to do the job by proxy, as it were? All right, pause to answer question one, or think about it, but keep reading. Explain yourself, man. Well, I mean like this. After the racket last night, this young Mr. Mar Marston gets the wind up and poisons himself. And Rogers, he gets the wind up too and bumps off his wife. All according to UNO's plan. Armstrong shook his head. He stressed the point about the cyanide. Blore agreed. Yes, I'd forgotten that. Not a natural thing to be carrying about with you. But how did it get into his drink, sir? Lombard said. I've been thinking about that. Marston had several drinks that night. Between the time he had his last one and the time he finished the one before it, there was quite a gap. During that time, his glass was lying about on some table or other. I think, though I can't be sure, it was on the little table near the window. The window was open. Somebody could have slipped a dose of the cyanide into the glass. Stop to answer question one. Bloor said unbelievingly, Without our all seeing him, sir? Lombard said dryly, We were all rather concerned elsewhere. Armstrong said slowly, That's true, we'd all been attacked. We were walking about, moving about the room, arguing, indignant, intent on our own business. I think it could have been done. All right, this helps answer part of question five. So if you get to question five and the later in the chapter, come back to the front of this video for this section if you need help. Bloor shrugged his shoulders. Fact is, it must have been done. Now then, gentlemen, let's make a start. Nobody's got a revolver by any chance. I suppose that's too much to hope for. Lombard said, I've got one. He patted his pocket. Bloor's eyes opened very wide. He said in an over-casual tone, Always carry that about with you, sir? Lombard said, Usually. I've been in some tight places, you know. Oh, said Bloor, and added, Well, you've probably never been in a tighter place than you are today. If there's a lunatic hiding on this island, he's probably got a young arsenal on him. To say nothing of a knife or dagger or two. Armstrong coughed. You may be wrong there, Bloor. Many homicidal lunatics are very quiet, unassuming people. Delightful fellows. Bloor said, don't feel like this one's going to be of that kind, Dr. Armstrong. Stop here to answer question two. Part two. The three men started on their tour of the island. It proved unexpectedly simple. On the northwest side, towards the coast, the cliffs fell sheer to the sea below, their surface unbroken. On the rest of the island, there were no trees and very little cover. The three men worked carefully and methodically, beating up and down from the highest point to the water's edge, narrowly scanning the least irregularity in the rock, which might point to the entrance to a cave. But there were no caves. They came at last, skirting the water's edge, to where General MacArthur sat looking out to sea. It was very peaceful here with the lap of the waves breaking over the rocks. The old man sat very upright, his eyes fixed on the horizon. He paid no attention to the approach of the searchers. His oblivion of them made them his oblivion of them made one at least faintly uncomfortable. My goodness. So what I bungled that sentence means that MacArthur really didn't care that they were out there searching and that MacArthur um him not caring made uh Bloor and Armstrong a little uncomfortable. Bloor thought to himself, "'Tisn't natural. Looks as though he's gone into a trance or something." He cleared his throat and said in a would-be conversational tone, "'Nice peaceful spot you found for yourself, sir.' The general frowned. He cast a quick look over his shoulder. 
He said, there is so little time, so little time. I really must insist that no one disturbs me. <clears throat> Bloor said genially, we won't disturb you. We're just making a tour of the island, so to speak. Just wondered, you know, if someone might be hiding on it. This is for question three. The general frowned and said, you don't understand. You don't understand at all. Please go away. Bloor retreated. He said as he joined the other two, he's crazy. It's no good talking to him. Lombard asked with some curiosity, what did he say? Bloor shrugged his shoulders. Something about there being no time and that he didn't want to be disturbed. Dr. Armstrong frowned. He murmured, I wonder now. Section three, this whole section helps with question three. So, <clears throat> pay attention. The search of the island was practically completed. The three men stood on the highest point looking over towards the mainland. There were no boats out. The wind was freshening, Lombard said. No fishing boats out? There's a storm coming. Damn nuisance, you can't see the village from here. We could signal or do something. Bloor said, we might light a bonfire tonight, Lombard said, frowning. The devil of it is that that's all probably been provided for. In what way, sir? How do I know? Practical joke, perhaps. We're to be marooned here. No attention is to be paid to signals, etc. Possibly the village has been told there's a wager on. Some damn fool story anyway. Bloor said dubiously, think they'd swallow that? Lombard said dryly, it's easier of belief than the truth. If the village were told that the island was to be isolated until Mr. Unknown Owen had quietly murdered all his guests, do you think they'd believe that? Dr. Armstrong said, there are moments when I can't believe it myself. And yet, Philip Lombard, his lips curling back from his teeth, said, and yet, that's just it. You've said it, doctor. Bloor was gazing down into the water. He said, Nobody could have clambered down here, I suppose. Armstrong shook his head. I doubt it. It's pretty sheer. And where could he hide? Bloor said, there might be a hole in the cliff. If we had a boat now, we could row round the island. Lombard said, if we had a boat, we'd all be halfway to the mainland by now. True enough, sir. Lombard said suddenly, we can make sure of this cliff. There's only one place where there could be, reset, be a recess. Just a little to the right below here. If you fellows can get hold of a rope, you can let me down to make sure. Bloor said, might as well be sure, though it seems absurd on the face of it. I'll see if I can get a hold of something. He started off briskly down to the house. Lombard stared up at the sky. The clouds were beginning to mass themselves together. The wind was increasing. He shot a sideways look at Armstrong. He said, you're very silent, doctor. What are you thinking? Armstrong said slowly, I was wondering exactly how mad old MacArthur was. Section four. Uh, so anyway, that was the answer to question three. So use that whole section for question three. And I'm going to close my door because my dogs are very loud. Hold on, please. All right. <clears throat> Vera had been restless all the morning. She had avoided Emily Brent with a kind of shuddering aversion. Miss Brent herself had taken a chair just round the corner of the house so as to be out of the wind. She sat there knitting. Every time Vera thought of her, she seemed to see a pale drowned face with seaweed entangled in the hair. A face that had once been pretty, impudently pretty, perhaps, and which was now beyond the reach of pity or terror. And Emily Brent, placid and righteous, sat knitting. On the main terrace, Mr. Justice Wargrave sat huddled in a porter's chair. His head was poked down well into his neck. When Vera looked at him, she saw a man standing in the dock. A young man with fair hair and blue eyes and a bewildered, frightened face. Edward Seaton. And, and in imagination, she saw... And in imagination, she saw the judge's old hands put the black cap on his head and begin to pronounce sentence. After a while, Vera strolled slowly down to the sea. 
She walked along towards the extreme end of the island where an old man sat staring out to the horizon. General MacArthur stirred at her approach. His head turned. There was a queer mixture of questioning and apprehension in his look. It startled her. He stared intently at her for a minute or two. She thought to herself, how queer. It's almost as though he knew. He said, ah, it's you. You've come. Vera sat down beside him. She said, do you like sitting here looking out to sea? He nodded his head gently. Yes, he said, it's pleasant. It's a good place, I think, to wait. To wait, Vera said sharply. What are you waiting for? He said gently, the end. But I think you know that, don't you? It's true, isn't it? We're all waiting for the end. She said unsteadily, what do you mean? General MacArthur said gravely, none of us are going to leave the island. That's the plan. You know it, of course, perfectly. What, perhaps, you can't understand is the relief. Vera said wonderingly, the relief, he said. Yes, of course, you're very young. You haven't got to that yet, but it does come. The blessed relief when you know that you've done with it, with, that you've done with it all, that you haven't got to carry the burden any longer. You'll feel that too someday. All right, stop here and think how what you've heard so far can help for question four. So if you haven't read the questions yet, you also need to do that. Vera said hoarsely, I don't understand you. Her fingers worked spasmodically. She felt suddenly afraid of this quiet old soldier. He said musingly, you see, I loved Leslie. I loved her very much. Vera said questioningly, was Leslie your wife? Yes, my wife. I loved her and I was very proud of her. She was so pretty and so gay. Gay means happy, my friends. He was silent for a minute or two. Then he said, yes, I loved Leslie. That's why I did it. Vera said, you mean, and she paused. General MacArthur nodded his head gently. It's not much good denying it now. Not when we're all going to die. I sent Richmond to his death. I suppose in a way it was murder, curious murder, and I've always been such a law-abiding man. But it didn't seem like that at the time. I had no regrets. Served him damned well right. That's what I thought. But afterwards, in a hard voice, Vera said, well, afterwards, he shook his head vaguely. He looked puzzled and a little distressed. I don't know. I don't know. It was all different, you see. I don't know if Leslie ever guessed. I don't think so. But you see, I didn't know about her anymore. She'd gone far away where I couldn't reach her. And then she died. And I was alone. Vera said, alone alone. And the echo of her voice came back to her from the rocks. General MacArthur said, you'll be glad too when the end comes. Vera got up. She said sharply, I don't know what you mean. He said, I know my child. I know. You don't. You don't understand at all. General MacArthur looked out to see again. He seemed unconscious of her presence behind him. Finish question four. He said very gently and softly, Leslie, when Bloor returned from the house with a rope coiled over his arm, he found Armstrong where he had left him staring down into the depths. Bloor said breathlessly, where's Mr. Lombard? Armstrong said carelessly, going to test some theory or other. He'll be back in a minute. Look here, Bloor, I'm worried. I should say we were all worried. The doctor waved an impatient hand. Of course, of course, I don't mean it that way. I'm thinking of old MacArthur. What about him, sir? Dr. Armstrong said grimly, what we're looking for is a madman. What price, MacArthur? Bloor said incredulously, you mean he's homicidal? Armstrong said doubtfully, I shouldn't have said so, not for a minute. But of course, I'm not a specialist in mental diseases. I haven't really had any conversation with him. I haven't studied him from that point of view. 
This helps for question five. Bloor said doubtfully, Gaga, yes, but I wouldn't have said. Armstrong cut in with a slight efforts as of a man who pulls himself together. You're probably right. Damn it all. There must be someone hiding on the island. Ah, here comes Lombard. They fastened the rope carefully. Lombard said, I'll help myself all I can. Keep a lookout for a sudden strain on the rope. After a minute or two, while they stood together watching Lombard's progress, Bloor said, Climbs like a cat, doesn't he? There was something odd in his voice. Dr. Armstrong said, I should think he must have done some mountaineering in his time. Maybe. There was a silence, and the ex-inspector said, Funny, sort of cove altogether. Do you know what I think? What? He's a wrong un. Armstrong said doubtfully. In what way? Bloor grunted. Then he said, I don't know exactly, but I wouldn't trust him a yard. Dr. Armstrong said, I suppose he's led an adventurous life. Bloor said, I bet some of his adventures have, have had to be kept pretty dark. He paused and then went on. Did you happen to bring a revolver along with you, doctor? Armstrong stared. Me? Good Lord, no. Why should I? Bloor said, why did Mr. Lombard? Armstrong said doubtfully, I suppose, habit? Bloor snorted. A sudden pull came on the rope. For some moments, they had their hands full. Presently, when the strain relaxed, Bloor said, there are habits and habits. Mr. Lombard takes a revolver to out-of-the-way places, right enough, and a primus and a sleeping bag and a supply of bug powder, no doubt. But habit wouldn't make him bring the whole outfit down here. It's only in books people carry revolvers around, as a matter of course. Dr. Armstrong shook his head perplexedly. They leaned over and watched Lombard's progress. His search was thorough, and they could see at once that it was futile. Presently, he came up over the edge of the cliff. He wiped the perspiration from his forehead. Well, he said, we're up against it. It's the house or nowhere. So, um... Right here when it said his search was futile, that means it like kind of ended up empty handed. It was like a waste of time. They found nothing and we're up against it. It's the house or nowhere. So he didn't find a place to hide in the cove or the cliff and they have no place to hide from being killed either. So it's the house or nowhere. Section six. The house was easily searched. They went through the few outbuildings first and then turned their attention to the building itself. Mrs. Rogers' yard measured, oh my goodness, Mrs. Rogers' yard measure discovered in the kitchen dresser assisted them. But there was no hidden spaces left unaccounted for. Everything was plain and straightforward, a modern structure devoid of concealments. They went through the ground first floor. As they mounted to the bedroom floor, they saw through the landing window Rogers carrying out a tray of cocktails to the terrace. Philip Lombard said slightly, Wonderful animal, the good servant, carries on with an impassive countenance. Armstrong said appreciatively, Rogers is a first-class butler, I'll say that for him. Bloor said, His wife was a pretty good cook, too. Pretty good cook, too. That dinner, last night. They turned into the first bedroom. Five minutes later, they faced each other on the landing. No one hiding. No possible hiding place. Bloor said, There's a little stair here, Dr. Armstrong said. It leads up to the servant's room. Bloor said, There must be a place under the roof for cisterns, water tank, etc. It's the best chance and the only one. And it was then, as they stood there, they heard the sound from above. A soft, furtive footfall overhead. They all heard it. Armstrong grasped Bloor's arm. Lombard held up an admonitory finger. Quiet. Listen. It came again. Someone moving softly, furtively, overhead. Armstrong whispered, He's actually in the bedroom itself. The room where Mrs. Rogers' body is. Bloor whispered back, Of course best hiding place he could have chosen. Nobody likely to go there. Now then, quiet as you can. 
They crept stealthily upstairs. On the little landing outside the door of the bedroom, they paused again. Yes, someone was in the room. There was a faint creak from within. Laura whispered, Now! He flung the door open and rushed in, the two other close behind him. Then all three stopped dead. Rogers was in the room, his hands full of garments. Section 7. Bloor recovered himself first. He said, Sorry, uh, Rogers. Heard someone moving about in here and thought, well, he stopped. Rogers said, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I was just moving my things. I take it there will be no objection if I take one of the vacant, vacant guest chambers on the floor below, the smallest room. It was to Armstrong that he spoke, and Armstrong replied, Of course, of course, get on with it. He avoided looking at the sheeted figure lying on the bed. Rogers said, Thank you, sir. He went out of the room with his arm full of belongings and went down the stairs to the floor below. Armstrong moved over to the bed and, lifting the sheet, looked down on the peaceful face of the dead woman. There was no fear there now, just emptiness. Armstrong said, Wish I'd got my stuff here. I'd like to know what drug it was. Then he turned to the other two. Let's get finished. I feel it in my bones. We're not going to find anything. Bloor was wrestling with the bolts of a low manhole. He said, That chap moves damn quietly. A minute or two ago, we saw him in the garden. None of us heard him come upstairs. Stop for question five. Lombard said, I suppose that's why we assumed it must be a stranger moving up about up here. Bloor disappeared into a cavernous darkness. Lombard pulled a torch from his pocket and followed. Five minutes later, three men stood up, stood on an upper landing and looked at each other. They were dirty and festooned with cobwebs and their faces were grim. There was no one on the island but their eight selves. All right, so if you need any uh, thing with the questions, you can kind of scroll through the video and look for those yellow um, highlighted lines that helps you with what questions to answer. See, you, see your answers on my, on my Moodle account. <laughs> Till next chapter. Goodbye.